let's start with easy questions. Could you tell us your name, please? My name is Mary Elizabeth Sebastian Alcesser. And I know you go by something else. Betty. My father gave that name to the lawyers and said that's her name. I never want to hear it again. She's Betty. And my husband, to the day of his death, said he wasn't positive that we were married because in the entire ceremony, Monsignor Casey never once said, do you marry Elizabeth? He said, do you Betty? And he said, he said Betty, the marriage license says Mary Elizabeth, and I always ended it by saying, honey, we've got five kids, we've been together almost 60 years, yeah, we're married. And could you tell us, where were you born? I don't know. I was brought to an orphanage in Columbus and left. And they refused to say what city they were from. It was just they, if the nuns would take me, if not, they would go back for further instruction. So I really don't know. I was born. Well, that's excellent. Do you know uh, which orphanage were you at? St. Vincent's. Well, St. Anne's first. Uh, St. Anne's was across the street. That was the infant orphanage. And then St. Vincent's took them from the first grade on. What was that like growing up in an orphanage like that? Wonderful. Really? It was, it was, I get angry every time I see or even hear of Annie because of how terrible it all was. And I didn't have that. In, in, the, in the infant's orphanage, I only remember the one time when I was taken on approval and taken back because they said I was a crybaby. Only I wasn't. <laughs> but I was being saved for what came later. But at the orphanage, the, the nuns were so sweet and so kind. And she was having, an, my daughter was having an operation on her hands and we were up there to the uh, hospital. Is it St. Anne's Hospital? St. Anne's Hospital. And so she had gone in for her surgery, and they told us to go on down and get a cup of coffee or something. And as we walked out of the cafeteria, St. Anne's or, uh, Hospital, which was from the St. Anne's Infants uh, Orphanage, as we walked around the corner, there was all these uh, pictures on the wall from their original, where they had been an orphanage. And as we walked around there, my eye went straight to a picture and there was the hobby horse on the closed-in back porch that I couldn't walk. I literally stood there and couldn't walk because the day that those people brought me back, sister had taken me out on the porch and put me up on this big hobby, it was a big hobby horse. And I remember, you know, just rocking on it and everything. And then after a while, she came back and took me in her arms and she said, you're going to be back with us, honey. You're you're going back to, to to be with us, and I could, and I remember telling her, I'm glad. And she took me back to the dormitory, and and there was my bed, and I just picked up my life there. It was fine. It was. We had friends. We always were warm. We had food. We had everything, and we had the love of the nuns. We had the love of the nuns, and then. I was transferred over to uh, St. Vincent's when I turned six, and it w I had gone there in September, and this is the following July, and I, had I didn't like to play with other kids. I really didn't. I, I preferred, boy, when I learned to read, that was my salvation. I loved that. But I found a way to climb out. There was a big fire escape. And the instructions were nobody was to ever go out on the fire escape in case of an emergency. An older child was assigned to a younger child. They will come and get you, and you will all take your turn going out the windows. Well, I found a way to unlock the window, and I was able to climb out the third floor. And I climbed out, and I could sit there and look out over the wall and just see the, the passing of people, things. So I was sitting there one day, it was in July, and I saw this beautiful car drive up. And they, you know, parked the car and they went in with a child. And a while later, they came back out. And they got in the car, but the child wasn't with them. I observed all that from my perch. 
And then I saw them, it was a horseshoe driveway, and I saw them go down to the street, and it paused, and then it turned and came back up and stopped. And it was parked right there, and I'm right here. And I saw the lady looking out at the window. It was playtime, and the kids were all in the playground. And she was sitting there looking, and the gentleman was sitting at the wheel, and he had his hands like this. And he was just staring straight ahead. And all of a sudden he looked up and we literally, our eyes met. And he jumped out of the car and ran over to the playground and grabbed a nun. I mean, in 1936, you didn't touch a nun, much less grab one. But he grabbed her and he was, you know, and very frantically talking and everything. And I thought, uh-uh, I'm caught because he's reporting that the little girl's up there on the fire escape. Well, I climbed back in, I locked the window, and I got under the, we had triple bunks, and I was on the floor under the last bunk, just kind of sitting there, going, oh boy. And here comes Sister, and she stood in the doorway, and she said, Barbara Rose, that was my name then. She said, Barbara Rose, I know you're under that bed, now come on, child. So I crawled out, and I took her hand and we went down three flights of stairs and not a word spoken between us. And we turned towards Mother Superior's office. Uh, oh boy, I'm in big trouble. You don't go to Mother Superior unless you needed to go to Mother Superior. So she, we walked down, she opened the door, she just took her hand and guided me in and then she shut the door behind me. Now I was six, I looked like I was about four tiny little thing. And I'm standing there and I looked at, at the room, of course I knew where Mother Superior was, I'd been there before. And I looked, there she was behind her desk and here was this, the man and the lady sitting in the chairs beside her desk. And it was a, it literally was, I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, I'm looking at you, you're looking at me. And this went on, nobody said a word. And all of a sudden, I walked over, and my father was sitting in the chair like this. Well, by me walking to, and he was sitting, we were eyeball to eyeball. And I looked at him and I said, I've been waiting on you, where have you been? And he grabbed me up in his arms, and he put me on his lap, and he had his hands around me like this, and he was shaking. And the first words I heard out of his mouth was, I told you she was mine. And anyways, that was my meeting. I found out later that they had taken eight children, one at the time, and uh, they were elderly. And Monsignor Goble from down to St. Mary's had taken them up there. And that was when the Monsignor was, I mean, he was next to God. And he took them up to the uh, orphanage and vouched for them that they were good people. And yes, they were a little older, but they were they were both in excellent health. And and they needed a child. Well, they took eight. And every time they'd had them for a couple of months, my mother would say to him, "Do you like, you know, do you love this child?" And my father always answered, "I don't love them, but I like them, and it's all right." And my mother said, "No." You have to love the child or it won't work. And finally, when they had taken the eighth one, and she she said it broke her heart every time she took one back because she loved, my mother loved every child that was ever born. And she told him, she said, there is no child for you. And my father said, well, I guess not. But he said, it's all right, I, you know, it's fine. No, couldn't be. And then he, when he said, I told you she was mine, well, see, sister had said, you've taken eight. This little girl has no name. She has no history. She has nothing. And my father was saying, I have got a name. You can go back to where I came from. And our family came to Peña in 1632. Now, before that, they were in Spain. I don't know before that. And the sister, of course, trying to tell him, no, I don't mean your name. I mean her. He said, she's mine. So anyways, that was the beginning of a love affair that lasted through my marriage, through five children, and still my husband knew my father, 
was just, when we met, it was like two soulmates meeting. And it was, it, we were together. He, they were Italian. They had come from Italy. And I was his interpreter. I was helping him buy houses when I was 10 years old. I would find the, I don't mean big, but I mean down there in, in the North End where we lived. He would buy these houses and fix them up and rent them to people. And, and he was a good landlord. And I would find, I'd say, Daddy, I found one. And we'd go and, okay, then we'd go down to the bank and we'd make, I was doing this when I was 10 years old. By the time I was 12, the Second World War had started and we had the Office of Price Administration. And what that was is that they had complete control of what profit you could make on anything that you sold, whether it was groceries or tires or clothes, you had to go through the Office of Price Administration. So when that came about, Daddy took me down to the Gilbert Grocery Company. It's down there on 2nd and Washington Street. It's still there, the building. And uh, the lady that was in charge of their bookkeeping had made an appointment for us to come, and she was going to show me how to take care of the books and how to fill out the forms. I was 12 years old. Every Sunday we had to count all this, because you got, I mean, if you bought something, you had to have a stamp. And, and then we had tokens, because if something was worth uh, six points, where you had a five or two fives and, or a ten, you had to get, and these little red tokens were your change, that you, they were, each one was a point. So anyways, she showed me how to do it, how you had to keep a book, every case that you bought, you had to put over here, how much you paid for it, then you looked at your uh, program to see what percentage you could charge, and you would do that, put that on, and then per, ca uh, per uh, can, that's how much you charge for that, and then you had to keep a, a running total of when you had the bills for what you bought. So there would be no black marketing, there would be nothing, you know. And it used to tickle me, and this is how things go. The gentleman that was in charge of the Office of Price Administration for the city of Portland, or for Scioli County, was Mr. S uh, Elsesser, who was a coach at PHS. I didn't know he was <laughs> going to be my second cousin once removed or however, because he and my father-in-law were first cousins. But this was in 1942. Who knew? And he used to get so perturbed because Daddy and I'd go in. To, you had your appointment every three months. You had to go in. You took your books. You, you know, you answered all the questions, and then you were certified for the next three months. And we'd go in, and we'd be sitting there together, and he would be talking to Daddy and asking Daddy, and he'd go, "I don't know. She takes care of the books. Talk to her." And he. He would talk to me, and he, oh honey, he would scrutinize it. I know he didn't take that much time with everybody. He couldn't have. But he never, in the entire time of the Second World War, he never caught me once in a mistake. But, but that's the, the life that we, we were, we finished each other's sentences. And in the store, people would ask him something, and, and he'd tell, either he would say something to them and they didn't quite understand him, or he didn't quite understand what they were saying. And it, they'd say, Betty, tell your father what I said. And I'd turn around, I'd say it in English, you know, I'd just tell, and they but that's what I said and he didn't understand me. I said, he doesn't understand the cadence of your voice. Because my mother's favorite, favorite thing for, she, she'd say, tell me that thing you say, and I said, I told her to play could spuds up the holler for, for a piece. And she said, you toted a poke of spuds up the holler of fur piece. Now what does that mean? I walked up the, the road with a, a, a sack of potatoes a long way. And she said, but Amer English is supposed to be English. I go, well, Mom, that's what they say in the hollers in, uh, over in Kentucky, and that's, that's how it's a, a different vernacular. She said, oh, just like the Sicilian and the Calabrese and, and the Napolitan. I said, yeah, same thing, because they all say things like cry, chanja, pianja, 
uh, you know, it, it, it just according to where, what community you were from, you did speak and she said, that sounds so cute. <laughs> and every now and then she'd just say, say it for me, and I'd try to say it as fast as I could. And it, it amused her, it amused her. So anyways, my goodness, you just asked me where I was born. <laughs> How was that when you had Italian parents, and this was during World War II, did uh, the local people around here, was it, did they treat them differently? I'll tell you exactly how it was. My father got his citizenship in 1929. He believed in, well, we just had the election this week. He believed in, see, he came to America in 1911. He, his father had a large lumber yard. He, he was a uh, cattle broker and he, he, he was a well off man. And all of these people that were coming to America and my dad was 19, and his father gave him $500 and a round-trip ticket from Italy to America and back. He said, go, enjoy yourself, you know, say hello to all your friends, and then come home because you've got to get settled down, you've got to learn the business. So Papa came, and he started in Maine, and he had all of the listing. He went from Maine down to New York, to New Jersey, across Pennsylvania, into West Virginia, down to a got to Portsmouth. And several people here in Portsmouth were from his hometown, exactly. And it was, you know, old home. And the more he got involved with it, he was always fond of saying, I stayed because in Italy, you have a king. The king is no good. But you can't get rid of him, he's the king. So he dies and his son comes along. Maybe his son's better, maybe he's worse. What are you gonna do? You can't do anything. You either kill him, which they did quite often in history, you know that. He said, but you can't get rid of him. And another thing, if you were born the son, like he was born the son of a, a businessman, he was well thought of. If your father was the uh, garbage collector, or whatever. That's where you had to stay. You couldn't change. You couldn't get above. You were always the son or the daughter of so-and-so. Well, he said, in America, it doesn't matter. You're born. You make a go of it, and you are okay. Nobody cares that where you came from. It's what you did. And he said, with the elections, you don't like, you put somebody in office and you don't like him, or you don't, and you say, oh, that isn't what I thought he was going to do. He said, you don't have to kill him. You don't have, you don't have to uh, wait for him to die. You vote him out of the, you go and you say, and it's gone. He's out. Somebody else is in. He said, I love that. So we had this little grocery store, and literally we had the, the, the apple crates, and the people would sit around and talk, just like you've seen in old movies. The men, not the women, the women didn't do that, but the men would come in and they would discuss politics. And, oh, you know, they were going to solve the problems of the world. And they'd all be talking. And my father would look at uh, the different ones and he, you didn't vote last time. Because the voting house was just three doors up from one store. And election day was devoted to election day. And uh, he'd say, you didn't vote. No, I was busy, I did, but doesn't matter. You listen. You don't talk because you didn't vote. You shut up. Next time we have elections, you go vote, then you can talk. And they would sit there and take it. They wouldn't listen to him. And he would, they would say to him occasionally, you know, because he'd say, go vote, go vote. And they'd say, why do you tell us to go vote? You know we're all Democrats. You're a Republican. We, we're going to kill your vote before you even get in there. He said, doesn't matter. I will vote. Sometimes I win. Sometimes I lose. But he said, vote. It doesn't matter to me which one you vote for, but you have to go vote. And they would, and they would literally come from Miss Howard's garage where the voting was and come straight to the store before they went back home and say, I voted. Okay, you can talk next time. And then, and he kept that all in his mind. He knew who had voted, who hadn't voted. And it, it, it was the most 
liberating. I mean, I learned more about politics by the time I was 10 years old because I was always there listening to all of them. And in 1940, when Wendell Wilkie was up against Roosevelt, well, of course, even with lack of communication, by 9 o'clock we knew that Roosevelt had taken the country. The radios were given out enough of that that we all knew that. So anyways, we had the grocery store, and the house was right behind it. It was all connected, you know. And we were sitting there, and I heard we heard noises. And Daddy said, go see what's going on. So I went down, you know, went down through the dark store and opened the front door. And there were all the neighborhood. I mean, Finley Street was blocked. Everybody was out, and they had pans, and they, had, they were, you know, making noise and everything. And uh, they said, Betty, we want your father. I go, okay, well, just a minute. So I, you know, went back up and, oh, honey, this is 1940. You, you would no more thought something terrible was going to happen than that the earth was going to swallow you. I left the door open and I went back up and I said, Daddy, they want you. So by the time Daddy got down, what they had done, they'd gone down to Emmerich's, uh, where Daylor is now, the funeral home. They had gone down there and they had got the wood box, uh, the, the paper box that the caskets had come in. Now, they had that on, they had put it on some barrels or something, but there was the casket, they had painted it, and it said, rest in peace, W.W., Wendell Wilkie. They had put candles at the four ends, but they were gone. The candles were burning, and there was the casket with rest in peace, W.W., Papa comes down, there was two, two or three steps, you know, from the door down to the sidewalk part, and he came down, he walked all around it, and, hmm, nice, hmm, okay, all right, and you didn't hear a word, I mean, where they disappeared, they were behind cars, they were behind bushes, they were, there was no one on the street. Papa stood there and he said, all right, you've had your fun, now everybody, come on out, come on, I want to talk to you, come on. And they started coming out from behind the, wherever they were, you know, and they all were standing there and had their tin cans and their pans and everything. And Daddy said, Betty, go get the candy and cigarettes, uh, the cigars, candy and cigars. So I went back in the store, you know, and got a big sack and getting all the candy bars and the cigars. And I went down and passed out, you know, candy to the ladies and the children, cigars to the men. So everybody took one and we were standing there and he said, now, he said, I want to talk to you people. And he said, I want you to listen. You don't believe me tonight, but you will someday. He said, Mr. Roosevelt got in by lying to all of you. He told you that your children would not go overseas because the war had just started. He said, he assured you that your children would not go into any fights, nowhere. And he said, he went on, you know, and then he said, when it comes the time, and I'm sorry it's going to come, but when it comes the time, he said, you come and tell me that I was right and you were wrong. Tonight I know you feel that you are right and I am wrong. But he said, you come to me when the time comes and admit that he lied to you. And uh, so, I'll go back a little bit to 1938. We went to the movie three times a week. It was just mom and dad and me, you know. And three times a week we went to the movie because that's when they changed the bill. Every time they changed the bill, you got a new uh, news of the day. So we went every, we went Sunday, we went either Wednesday or Thursday, and then we went again on Friday. Because that would be, you know, Friday and Saturdays. So uh, we were there and they had the news of the day, and the Queen of England and the King of England were standing in Hyde Park with Mr. and Mrs. Roosevelt. They had come and he had spoken before the Congress. This is, you know, they were laying the groundwork, and they were standing there with a hot dog, each one of them. Instead of having the big steak dinner like you always do for heads of states and things down there at the White House, to show how how wonderful he was and how much he was a man of the people. He, Hyde Park was, oh my God, beautiful. 
It was beautiful. And his mother had all, well, the Roosevelt's, they were clear back in, in history, the Roosevelt's had money. So here the queen and the king are standing there in the garden, each one with a hot dog in their hand. Because it's an American picnic. I never saw either one of them take a bite, but they were standing. My father was sitting there, <clears throat> we're in the theater. Papa could not whisper if his life depended on it. So we, we were sitting there, and of course, we, he called, he'd say, now pay attention to that, we talk when we go home. Pay attention to this, we talk when we go home. Okay, now, you know, and I did, I paid attention. So I get the elbow in the ribs, because that's always the key. Hey, Betty, hey, you see that? I said, what, Papa? You see that, the queen, the king, whatever they got in their hands. I mean, he's talking in the, I said, they got a hot dog. You know, forget, we talk when we get home. I said, okay. So when we got home, he said, you remember that. You saw the queen of England with the hot dog in her hand. You saw the king of England, where they should have been at a state dinner with all the silverware, with all the glassware and everything. He said, I don't know what, but that's going to cost us dearly that they would come and lower themselves to standing there with a hot dog. They didn't do that for nothing. He said, it's going to cost. Now you remember, son of the gun, Lend-Lease program, before we ever got into the war. We couldn't give them assistance because that was against our constitution and everything, but they figured out we will lend it to them. We are leasing it to them. When it's over with, they'll give it all back to us. We're not helping them. We're not giving it to them. We're lending it. And it, it was called the Lend-Lease Program. This comes out. Papa says, did I not tell you? What about the hot dogs? He said, there it is, Betty. We're paying them back for them coming over and lowering themselves to standing there with the hot dog. Probably Mr. Roosevelt never had a hot dog in his life. But that they would stand there and be photographed. He said, we're paying it back now. They came and with hat in hand, so to speak, and they got the they got the lend lease before we ever got into the war. Now I'm not saying that it was it wasn't wrong that we got in the war. I'm just saying he based it on a lie. He said he had no right to tell these mothers and fathers to come and vote because I'll never let your children go to war. But he this is what I grew up with. This is how we you know, this is how we talked and it was a wonderful, I always said for a kid that got got handed over in a basket <laughs> with the clothes on her back, I, I, I did so wonderful. And by these people bringing me back saying I was a crybaby when I wasn't, I was afraid of those monsters that were on the wall. That's what I was afraid of, but nobody ever asked me. Maybe they could have done something about it if they'd asked me, but I'm glad they didn't because I went back and in another two years, Papa, it just, I've been waiting on you, where have you been? And he held me so tight, and then we got in the car, about a half an hour later, we were gone. And we were going up Main Street, and I was bouncing from, it was a brand new Pontiac, I remember, it was a brand new Pontiac. I was bouncing from this side of the back seat to that side of the back seat and this side. Oh, look at this. Oh, look, look. Oh, look. You know, just going on. And then all of a sudden, I stopped and I tapped him on the shoulder. And I said, Daddy, I want an ice cream cone. He's been in my life for an hour now. And just, that's what I said. I remember saying it. It wasn't, could I have it? <laughs> Daddy. I want an ice cream cone. And he turned to my mother. And I didn't understand the words then, but I later I, you know, learned what they were. But he turned to my mother and he said, Oh, Bacha Dost, I like to literally translate it, Bacha is face. Dost is hard. So you would think he was saying hard face. No, in Italian what that means is somebody that is bold and sure of themselves. Ah, Bacha Dost. That was his, and I like, and it, it just was the love affair of the world, and good old Harold, I tell you, he was so 
considerate of all of that, you know. And at one point, they were going to give him a promotion up at work, and uh, to do it, we were going to have to go to Indiana for two years, and then they were going to transfer him back. And he came home and told me about it that evening. And I thought, oh dear God, I have to go. I mean, what am I going to do? And I was sitting there and just looking at him. And he said, Betty, I'm going to tell him in the morning. I can't go. He said, your mother and father are so wonderful and have been so wonderful to you. He said, how could I take you and those children to Indiana now in the last stages of their life he said, I can't do that. He said, we'll just stay the way we are, and, and that's the way it's going to be. And I said, thank you. I mean, what else What else can you say? Because I would have gone if I had to, but he said, I can't do that. And on my, my father died first, and on my mother's deathbed, she took my husband's hand, and she looked at me, and she said, you loved me but you loved your father, and God was good. I was, I'm sorry, you loved me, but you loved your father, and I was patient, and God sent me my son. And it, it is true. I mean, the day she met him, she just thought, this is the one. And it was. And it, we had almost 60 years. And it was, oh, we had a great life. But getting back to, we're still back at the flood, aren't we? Can, can I stop you real quick and ask sure. you just a curiosity question? You mentioned your dad's hometown. Where was that? Well, daddy was born in Castellamata, Italy. And mother was born in Pianella. They were about 12 miles apart. Yes, and they were cousins. And Daddy came in 1911, and of course then World War II come along, and uh, that cut off all communications. And then when the war was over, he wrote to uh, Mother's brother to inquire as to what her marital state was. Well, he wrote back and told her that he had uh, she had been engaged, but that she had broke the engagement, and that she was working with her brother-in-law. He was the uh, he was the station master for the uh, trains in Bari, Italy, which is a seaport town. And he was the station master, and she was his secretary. And so then, Daddy wrote to Mother's father, his uncle, and said he wanted to know if he had his permission to write to Mother. And he said, of course. You could write to her, whether she writes to you or not, I don't know, but he said, you, she's a grown woman, she, you have every right to write to her if you want to. Well, so they started corresponding, so the two mothers got together and said, we'll send her Margarita to America, she will marry him and bring him back home where he belongs. Well, mother wasn't particularly interested in it, she was quite, she was quite the the liberated woman. And she said, no, she didn't want to go. And they convinced her, oh yes, she needed to go, and then she could bring Daddy back, or bring him back to Italy, where he belonged, take his place in, in the family. And so she came to America, and she's buried up there at Greenlawn with him. Never. He, would, he said, no. He said, my life is here. And at the end of, 19, uh, at the, end of the war, I went with him, our lawyer, and, and Dad and I went down to the Italian consulate in Cincinnati because he had gotten word that his mother and father both had passed away by then, you know, and that he was listed as the primary. He had three or four, I forget now, three or four brothers, and he was listed as the primary beneficiary of the entire thing. And their brothers, this is, see, he said, this is Italy for you. Because I'm the firstborn. My brother stayed. They have their father. They, they built the business bigger than what it was. And I'm supposed to be the... So he took our lawyer, and we went down to the Italian consulate in Cincinnati, and 
They filled out the papers and he raised his hand and swore that of his own free will, he wanted no part of not one penny of it, he did not earn it. His father had given him $500 and a round trip ticket home back then and he said, I took it and made my own life. And he actually turned it all down. And his brothers just couldn't, couldn't believe it. But he said, no, you divide it between you. He said, it's not mine, I didn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. And I was there when, I, when he, you know, when we were there and he raised the dead. But we made it. We made it anyways. But getting back to the flood, I came here in July, and then they were talking about the flood coming, and I was so excited. I wanted to see a flood. Well, a few days later, after the flood had come and everything, you know, it stayed for several days. Several days, it stayed a long time. And we were staying on 18th Street with friends, and we walked down Waller Street to 17th Street, which the water had come halfway up the hill there, halfway up Waller Hill. And you could see, there was the water all over here. You could see the smokestacks and the Selby Shoe Company and, and different things. You could see that, but there was the water all over everything. And I was just turned seven, because I was seven on December 15th, and the flood was late January. So I had just turned seven. And I stood there, and we looked out at that, and Daddy said, you wanted to see a flood? He said, that's a flood then. That is a flood. He said, you be careful what you wish for in this life. You wanted to see it? You've seen it. Do you like it? I thought, no, yeah, no. And he said, be careful what you wish for in this world, because sometimes you get it and it's not what you think. So that was one lesson I got from the 37 flood. I got that. And I also got how, now my mother, as a, her father was the head schoolmaster of Piano, and she was well educated, and she, uh, she told me a story one time, they had a, a housekeeper, you know, a housemaid, and she was dusting, and uh, mom was about 10, and she said, here, my buddy, to help me. And she handed her a dust rag. And mother threw the dust rag down and she said, you're the servant, I'm not. And she started to walk out. Well, her mother heard her. And she came in and she picked up the dust rag and she said, young lady, help her. You need to learn how to do everything because right now you have everything. You don't know what the world will bring. You need to know how. And she said, you will help her, and you will tell her you're sorry for what you said. And it will, you know, she learned. But uh, anyways, there, here was this delicate woman who had just seven years before, Daddy had been working, and he was very ill. And the doctor told he worked at the Selby Shoe Company. He was a master shoemaker. And he was... Uh, all the fumes and everything, he, it, it, it was damaging him badly. And they, they were at the doctor down in Cincinnati. And uh, the doctor said, you either get out of that shoe factory or you're going to die. He said, there's no two ways about it. And I re could we stop for a minute? Yeah. Carol, I need a thank you. Oh. I'm sorry. He's going to take, he carried you know, this kind of stuff okay. out. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyways, so anyways, they were down there in the doctor's office, and my father looked at him and he said, well, what am I supposed to do? He said, do you want me to, to uh, take a, sta uh, a stalk of bananas and put it on my shoulder and go door to door selling bananas? And the doctor said, if that keeps you alive, I say yes. So they came home, you know, and of course he was... They had been married for almost ten, well, about ten years at that time. And he said, "What am I going to do if I can't be in the shoe factory? Where will I? What will I do?" And my mother sat there and she said, "We will make a grocery store." She said, "We'll take the living room 
and we'll build, have somebody build some shelves. And she said, we will get the, we will have, because they were neighborhood grocery stores all over the place at the time. I mean, you couldn't hardly walk out the door. There wasn't a, all, instead of these supermarkets, they were everywhere. And she said, we'll make a grocery store. She said, I will bake bread. And that the odor of the bread maybe will bring people in. And then we'll start. that's how they started their store. And by the time they had me, they had a nice, nice family grocery store, you know, built. So anyways, uh, here's everything they owned, everything they'd worked for. That would have been 16, 17 years then, because they married in 1920. So 17 years of living. When the waters receded, they had nothing because the water wasn't supposed to get as high as it did, and they had taken, they had an, they had built an apartment upstairs just the year before for some friends that, uh, well, they lived in it until Ray died. Anyways, uh, they they went up on the hill and they took stuff up there. Plus, they had built these higher shelves in the store and put stuff up. It was all gone. It was all gone. So mother would go down every day with daddy. And she would stand in that mud. He had found a pair of the of the knee-high boots. I don't know where he found them. Somebody had them for sale, and he bought them, and they fit her. And she would stand there. My delicate mother would stand there in that mud, cleaning stuff out. And they had told him, if you had three buckets, the health department said, if you have three buckets, you wash it in this, and you disinfect it in this, and you rinse it in this, and then you can sell it. So Daddy had hired some men to come and, and start doing that, and they're out in the backyard, you know, they're all set up, and they're scrubbing, and of course there's no labels on anything. And Daddy looked at it, and he said, you know, this is ridiculous. How do I sell something to a person, even for five cents, and they don't know what they're going to get until they open the can? So he went down and he asked, he said, what can I do with this? You said it's edible, but what do I do with it? And uh, they told him, well, the Salvation Army would take it because they had soup kitchens going, and whatever they opened, they would do something. And he said, okay. So he went to the Salvation Army. He said, you've got a truck, uh, you know, a big truck. Come, and you can get everything that I've got. He said, because it needs to be scrubbed like these guys are doing. He said, it needs to be scrubbed, but then they said, you can use it. They said, okay. So they came and took everything and took it down to Salvation Army. Now, he had a big building that he had built in the back attached to the garage. It was a soap room. Twice a year, he would get a, a half a year's supply of soap from the Procter & Gamble Company down in Cincinnati. and. He kept it there because soap, if you put that much soap together, it does not do good for other things. You know, it, the, the taste would get in the bread, get in anything if you if you have it stacked anywhere near. So he had it out there in this separate building. He had just got the New Year's supply in December. So that was six months worth of soap. And a couple weeks after the flood had subsided and people were beginning to get started again, the uh, representative from Procter & Gamble came by and he said, uh, the company wants to help people and uh, you get all of your labels and turn them in and they will give you fresh for what you uh, had. And Daddy took him out there, unlocked the door and said, there it is. And he said, you know that that came in last month. You know I had soap because you never get out, you always just replace. He said, you go back and you tell them at Procter & Gamble that there it is. I am not going to take one label off of anything. He said, if they want to give me a little something to help me get started again, I appreciate it and I will say thank you. But he said, I'm not going to get in there and or get somebody in there to clean that. He said, yeah, they're going to clean that mess out but they're not going to fool around with getting every label off it so they can hand them in to you. Now he said, you go tell them. Whatever they decide, fine. If they want to give me a little bit to start over, I say thank you. You know, about a week later, the guy came back and he said, I went in and told them what they said, or what you said, and they told me to replace the December order. 
say that whenever you're ready, because that all had to be scrubbed out and that all had to be dried out and everything, he said, in the meantime, you buy a little bit here in town what, what you need. But he said, when, you're, when your room is ready for it again, he said, we will replace the December order fully. And they did. They did. And he started over, and I, I remember they went down to the George Sheets, Dr. Sheets' father, had a uh, furniture store down on Second Street, and we had we didn't have a stick of furniture. It was all ruined. Everything was ruined. And they went down there. Of course, he had bought a lot of furniture down there in the past, anyways. And they replaced. You know, he got his living room, dining room got the kitchen, got the two bedrooms, and got it all brand new, and it was put on the books. It was put on the books, and, and Daddy paid it off. We got all... You didn't have people coming in helping you in those days. You know, you, you, you helped yourself, or you helped your neighbors, or something, but all this organized, there wasn't. There, the Red Cross did what they could, but they... You didn't depend on people to do it. You did it. And I remember George Sheets was the one that he got his furniture off of. We had we got started again and we just went on from there. Just it was the flood was horrible. But in no time at all it was okay. You breathe and you start again. And then in nineteen forty five we had the dry flood. Everybody had to move out. We were ordered out of our houses because the flood was coming and it wasn't going, they weren't going to be able to hold it back. And the National Guard came in and everything. So this time, well, right after the 37 flood, right after that, my father went up the, where we lived, or where we stayed, there on 18th Street. And he told uh, the, the guy, that, that it was a friend of ours, and he, he didn't have an automobile or anything. And he told him, he said, I will build you a nice cinder block garage. It's yours to use for whatever. But if we have another flood, you've got to let me put my stuff in there. And he said, uh, and they put it on the deed to the house. I don't know if it's still, <laughs> See, I don't know if it's still on those deeds or not, but if he sold the house, he sold the house with the provision that the American Italian Grocery had the rights to that garage in case of any flood. And so anyways, we put all of our stuff up there. And I remember I worked 36 hours without stopping. Because we had gone to school that morning and then they had said, you know, that everybody had to move out. And Daddy had hired a bunch of the guys, you know, to come. And they were boxing it all up and taking it up 18th Street. And I, I was helping, you know, we just worked, we worked. Now we had a chicken coop in the backyard and the farmers would bring the chickens in on Thursday, fresh chicken, you know, live chickens. They'd bring them in on Thursday and then we, uh, we, had, we uh, cleaned them ourselves and had fresh killed chickens. So, uh, don't know when it happened, have no idea when it happened. But at some, I had, I'd come home from school and I had this beautiful jumper on had two great big pockets here, you know, and it, it was a lovely jumper. I never changed clothes or anything, I just dug in and started working. And as I said, I worked for 36 hours, and then we finally left, went up on the hill, and I remember when I got out of the car, I couldn't walk. I was just exhausted. I could not walk. And I literally crawled on my hands and knees, I crawled upstairs and laid down on, they had, you know, it, we had one bedroom, mom and dad had the bed, and they had a, a mattress on the floor for me. And I crawled up on that mattress, and I went to sleep, and I didn't wake up till the next day, next afternoon. And when I woke up, I stood up, and I felt something. And I looked down in my pockets, somewhere in this going and coming, because we had boxes and things that we stored in the garage, well, I'd go get empty boxes and bring them and we'd fill. Somewhere in one of those trips, I evidently looked in that chicken coop and saw two eggs. And I had put one egg in each pocket. 
that it they were crushed they were dried I have no record I, I tried to remember when did I do that I have no recollection of those things ever breaking of ever drunk but I laid there my <laughs> bed but there they were at that time we didn't the blood didn't come in they came, well they kept saying they were going to have to let the waters in through the grates you know and the people now the, the people were together and they were down there on that flood wall putting sandbags together and at, when it was all over with the uh, Corps of Engineers said had they known that water would have gotten that high there was no way in this world they would have left, left those people there because it couldn't be it mathematically it couldn't be that that could hold the water back but it held it back because everybody they think another what's oh, going to go just a couple more hitches we can do it we can do it. and they kept putting more and kept putting more and kept putting more and they saved the town now we got our flood wall <laughs> but we're oh gosh oh i started to tell you about mom working in the store anyways i kept wanting to come down and see and so she said, all right, uh, your father will come and get you at noon, and you can come down and have lunch with us, and then he'll take you back up, you know, to 18th Street. So when I got down there, Mother had brought a tablecloth. She had taken a plank, and she had two barrels, and she had laid the plank, and she had the tablecloth on there, and she had fixed us a, a lunch, and we were sitting on barrels, little barrels, you know, little they things came in barrels and and uh, apple crates and things wood I mean these were all substantial things and she had there was a chair for me and daddy and her and just as we sat down to eat the plank broke and everything just tablecloth and all everything went down you know on that muddy floor and my mother sat there and she cried but it was the release of all this hell that she'd been through but she cried and she cried and then she quit crying and she fixed us each a sandwich and we had our sandwich and then she said then you go back up and you know stay with uh, with the, the polos and the, and we'll be up when, when we quit here tonight and that's the only time i ever saw her cry and she went right back to work and like i said they, they ended up with a bigger store than they had before the flood. In fact, they built, they added to it twice. But oh, that was, that was a flood. I de didn't know what a flood was. I found out. So when you, oh, I've got a question for you. Uh -huh. When you were growing up, you mentioned your mom making lunch. What kind of stuff were you eating most of the time? Were you Italian food or American food or? Oh, Italian. Oh, child, when, when I was in high school, we used to uh, meet on Sunday afternoon. A group of us would meet at, at one girl's house up here on Gallia Street. And uh, every time, as soon as I walked in the door, Mrs. Call would say, Come on, honey, I've got your, I got it for you. And I'd go back to the kitchen with her, and she would have me a dish of mashed, she'd warm it up when she saw me coming here, mashed potatoes and gravy. And I remember one Sunday I was sitting there and just enjoying it, talking to Mrs. Call. And her husband looked up, and he saw what I was eating, and I can still see him. He put his, because he was sitting there at the table reading the newspaper. He put his newspaper down, and he said, Gertrude, for heaven's sakes, put some meat on that plate for that girl. And Gertrude looked at him, and she said, Pat, you just touch your mouth. She doesn't want any meat. She doesn't want anything. She just enjoys mashed potatoes and gravy. Her mother doesn't make them. Oh, you know, he picked his pen. He said, I thought you just, well, she said, now you know I'd give her meat if that's what she wanted. <laughs> I can still see him. I was about 15, 16 years. But I loved mashed potatoes and gravy. Mother did make mashed potatoes and gravy. And once I tasted them, I just thought they were so delicious. So delicious. So, yes, we ate Italian. We spoke Italian. You want to hear how good I learned Italian? How well I learned Italian? Uh, 
1942, mother was diagnosed with cancer. Now this was after the war had started, and you had points to get gasoline, you had points to get tires, you know, the whole, and it ended up that she had to spend six weeks in Columbus. We had friends up there from Italy, and, and uh, so it was worked out that Daddy went up for the operation, of course, and then he came back home and mother stayed for six weeks because she had to keep going to the doctor after she got out of the hospital and of course they were able to take her over to the hospital. Doctor's hospital, I don't think it's there anymore, but it, in that thing, Dr. Watson. It was Dr. Watson at Doctor's Hospital. Yes. Anyways, they were able to excise the entire, she had colon cancer, uh, rectal cancer and they cleared that up and she lived to the age of 84. But anyways, I digress. So Papa and I were home alone. Now my father, what could I say? He knew where the kitchen was. That's it. Now when he first came to Portsmouth, uh, the Manhattan Grill, which it was down there on, Gally on the, the Esplanade, it was on What's there? Oh, I know. There's a uh, uh, the drive-in for the for the uh, National Bank. I forget what, whatever its name is today. They change them every other day. But that where that drive-in is. That was the Manhattan Grill on the first floor and hotel upstairs. And then the Lyric Theater was right next to it. Well, Papa lived at the Manhattan. He lived at the hotel and took all his meals there. So when Mother got sick, or was in Columbus. He went down and he, to, he told him, he said, I need food for me and Betty. He said, uh, you, fix, you fix it up for me, I'll come in on Monday and you, you have it all marked so that I can warm it up. Because he said, you know, I, and they all laughed because everybody knew Papa. <laughs> and uh, so every Monday, Daddy would take our, our uh, uh, big picnic basket down and casseroles and things. and. Then when he picked it up, it would they would have it marked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, th and so in that period of time, uh, Mrs. Conti died, and they, Mimi and 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 Alina and and Mom and Dad were all from that same area. So when they get, got to Portsmouth, it was like he was his brother. So anyway, she passed away, and we, it was then three days at the funeral. So uh, we closed the store at 6.30. We would hurry and eat, you know, in between. So the minute we locked the door, we were ready to go. And we'd go up to Melcher's, and we went up there. And Dad, I, Daddy would always make sure I had my homework, and he would take me to the back room. Now, in those days, honey, you couldn't get in the funeral home. It would, and they stayed till midnight sometimes, I think. Anyways, they were there. And Papa would take me to the back room where the ladies would take turns, you know, sitting back there and gossiping and whatnot while everybody else was out front crying. And he'd put me in the chair there in the corner and he'd say, now you got all your books, you got your, I got everything I need, Daddy. Okay, you, you sit there and, and do your homework and, and I'll just be out front, you know. Okay, fine. Well, I'm doing my homework and these women are all talking. And I mean different dialects. And they're all talking. What was some of them? So I put the books down and I'm listening. Oh my goodness. You want to get a bunch of women together talking about who isn't there? It is something to hear. Especially when you're my age. Just a kid. So on the way home, I'm sitting there, you know, and I'm I've always, I always was able to come home and they would sit there and listen to me about everything that happened during the day and, you know, what went on and they would listen. And Daddy, I'll tell you about the radio later. And so anyways, I'm telling you, Daddy, do you know what Mrs. So-and-so said about Mrs. So-and-so? No, what? And I told him and he's driving, you know, and he goes, are you sure? I said, Yes, Daddy. And Mrs. So and so said so and so, so, so yeah. And I'm telling him about the whole evening. And he said, You're sure now? I said, 
Yes, Daddy, I'm sure. He said, oh, okay. That's all he said. Okay. So the next evening, we go, same routine. I get my chair there in the corner, you know, and he makes sure I've got my books and I've got everything I need. Then he's getting ready to walk back out to go with the gentleman. He got to the door. Well, first of all, he said he didn't understand. No, 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 wait a minute. Okay. That, oh yeah, that was the first day. Yes, because they were talking. And the one lady said, what about Attilio's daughter? And the other one said, oh, she's adopted. What does she know? She doesn't know. Oh, and I told Daddy that. And that's this all in Italian. And I told Daddy that. And uh, so then the second day, when he got ready to leave, got to the door, he turned around, drew himself up to his magnificence. Do you, do you know the actor Omar Sharif? He was in uh, Lawrence of Arabia and a lot of... Anyways, if you ever see a picture of him, he could have been my father's brother. Honestly, I have pictures of my father that, that he just has that same... It was there. Anyways, he draws himself up to his full magnificence and stands. Not a word, just stands. And there, everybody's chit-chatting, you know. And all of a sudden, the conversation ceases. And they're all looking at Daddy. He walks over to the First Lady and he says, Oh, Mrs. So I understand last night you said such and such about Mrs. So-and-so. Mrs. So-and-so is sitting over there tonight because, you know, there's change of venue. He goes to the next one. And I, I understand that you said such and such. He went around to everyone that I had said in, that had said in, and said to them what they had said. And half of them, the people they had talked about, were there tonight. Well, they're all sitting there like this, you know, just sitting. Then when he got done, he walked back over to the door drew himself up again, had their full attention, and he said, now, if you people want to talk about anybody else, ask my daughter to leave, because unlike your uneducated children, my child understands every one of your dialects and understands them well. And he turned around and he walked out. Now I'm sitting there, you know, with my books in my lap, and I'm going, oh my God, they're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. He's left me here to die. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there, you know, like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And I literally, I was scared then. And, honey, they never looked at me. And they never said another bad thing about anybody. Not that night. But honestly, I thought, I'm going to die right here. They're going to pounce on me. But they didn't. They didn't. But they didn't talk about anybody else that night. But what got him the worst, when I told him that the one woman said, ah, oh, she doesn't know anything. Gonna let them know, buddy, she knew Italian better than their kids did, and they were, you know, all first generation here. But, oh, it, it was something. It was something. But, and Daddy would, every Monday, he'd take the dishes back down to, to, uh, the, uh, to the uh, Manhattan restaurant and they would fill them for the next week and they would fix casserole like things and spaghettis and d different things that he could heat up because honestly Papa couldn't cook. He couldn't cook. In fact, I couldn't either. When I got married, I could make the most beautiful cakes you'd ever want to see. And this is before cake mixers. I could make beautiful cakes. I could make a pineapple upside down cake. Uh, I could make beautiful cakes. I couldn't cook anything. So we came home from our honeymoon and we had T bone steaks and a salad for supper. And we were just getting ready to sit down to the table and the phone rang. And it was Daddy. He said, Come over for supper. Your mother's got supper ready. And I said, Well, Daddy. We're just getting ready to sit down to supper. I, I fix supper. And in the whisper that is never a whisper, he goes, Can he eat it? I said, Well, I'm going to find out in a few minutes. He said, Okay, I tell you what, when you get done eating, 
come over to the house because she made apple pie and that way he can have apple pie and he'll forget what you cooked. He knew I could, I mean his perfect little girl that could do anything couldn't cook because when we got done with the store we would go back you know into the back room into the house part mother would be back there fixing our supper now daddy and I would sit in the living room with the te with the radio I started to say television with the radio on and at the 6 30 and, and everything there was H.B. Cowtonborn spoke with an accent and there was Lowell Thomas with his mellow tones that you, you had to get that cadence to, to understand it you know and all those guys then there would be Amos and Andy and all those people and they would you know you'd hear all that laughter and we would sit there and I would tell daddy if there was something he didn't quite understand I would be telling him what just transpired while with the other ear I was listening to what was coming and this is how we spent our evening you know mother would do the cooking and daddy and I would sit there talking about politics and going through the newspaper the whole nine yards we were busy we didn't have and then all of a sudden I think he realized oh my gosh she's going to be cooking for him she doesn't even know I didn't know hardly where the kitchen was except I could make beautiful cakes <laughs> but we did go over to mom and dad's and we had the apple pie and I will say this for my husband in all the time that I was learning to cook and some of it was pretty bad I will tell you that right now never once did he say that's terrible or don't do that again. well yes he did the one time that I made the big fancy cake and it had coconut all over the front, of, all over it. And he said, Betty, I hate coconut. Honestly, I hate coconut. I said, okay, you know, I'll get rid of it. But other than that, you know, just for food, he ate stuff that honestly, looking back at it, I wonder how did he put it down? I don't know. But he never once said, that's terrible. Usually, if he did, if he, said sometimes he didn't say anything because I don't think there was anything he could say except horrible which he didn't say but usually he would say hey that's better than it was last week hey, you're getting the hang of that not that the hang of it was any much better, but I was getting better and I did learn to be a pretty good cook but honestly one time and this I swear I don't know how they fit how they managed to get that between them I don't know and I don't know that they did anyways I had made biscuits I made biscuits and you didn't have any bisquick or anything like that I made biscuits and I baked them and I swear to God if I'd gone out and got rocks out of the garden it couldn't have been any worse than those biscuits were Harold went to take one and he, he was going to break it open and put some butter on it and it slipped out of his hand and fell on the floor and the people downstairs were just getting ready to go out so our dining room was right over their living room and they were starting to go out you know because you went out the back and then around the side of the store and that evening later on we met up you know we had gone down for something or another and Nick said to Harold hey what what fell up there this evening? Uh, he said, just about the time we were leaving, he said, I, I swear it sounded like rocks or something. And Harold said, oh, uh, and then he laughed. And he said, Betty tried to make biscuits, and he said, you're kidding. Uh, yeah, Betty tried to make biscuits. <laughs> and then after we'd been married about a month, we, I was doing pretty good except that we had T-bone steaks and salad every night. And after a month of that, he said, Honey, I think it's time that you try something. Be he said, Everybody loves steak, but he said, It's been a month. And other than when we went over to my mom and dad's, which we did quite fre frequently, but nevertheless, he said, That's the only thing I'd cook was steaks. He said, How about a, pa a pot of bean soup tomorrow night? I go, Huh? He said, yeah, some navy beans. Well, we had the grocery store right down, the, you know, right under us. I said, okay. So he came home at 4.30. Well, he got off at 4.30. He was home by 5 o'clock. About 4 o'clock, I said, Daddy, I'm going to go upstairs and put a pan of beans on. Harold said he wanted beans tonight. 4 o'clock, I get 
some navy beans and I go upstairs and I wash them and I put them in the pan and put some water on them. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, those little after five or so, he said, what are we having for supper? And I said, well, you said you wanted bean soup. I said, now what do I put in here to, to uh, season them? And he went over to the stove. He said, when did you soak them? I said, why are you supposed to soak them? He said, Betty, I think you ought to call my mom. I, he said, I think she, she'll tell you. He said, honey, you've got to soak those overnight and, and rinse them. And, and, then, and he knew how to cook them. I didn't. He said, why don't you call mom and ask her? So I said, okay, I will. Well, uh, not, about nine months after we were married, he got drafted into the Korean War. He'd already been in the Merchant Marines during World War II. He was just a kid then, and he got drafted. And we ended up in San Francisco. He had been to Korea and the ship had got shot up and they brought it in for dry dock and I got to go out to San Francisco and stay with him for two months and uh, we went out there and of course as soon as we got there and we got an address and we called everybody and told them what our address was and four days later I had a package from Martins in the mail my mother-in-law had gone down to Martins and bought me a beautiful Betty Crocker cookbook <laughs> and nailed it. Hey, I appreciated it. I did. I, I, you know, nine months I wasn't quite up to on my own yet. And it was nice to be able to go, oh, you got to do this. Then we do that. <laughs> so, I, you know, I never took that as an insult. I took it. She was looking out for us because she figured her poor son was going to starve to death. He had to, because we always went to their house for dinner, or we went to my mom and dad's. You know, we were constantly going out. So then he was getting fed. Putting the two of us out there was, she just, and she got me a beautiful Betty Crocker book, and it it had it had a lot of stuff in it, and I learned from it. <laughs> And everybody gets to eat. <laughs> and everybody gets, yes. And we were the only ones that had an apartment. Well, we had two rooms, but it, it had a kitchen, and it had a bedroom, and, and a, you know, the kitchen was so big that, that it had uh, chairs, you know, had a sofa and chairs and everything. So we, uh, our group, there was uh, four of the set fellows, and three of the brides, Lord, I was the old lady of the group. And I didn't know nothing. And here's these three kids. I mean, they were like 19 and 18. Well, they were staying in the hotel rather than getting rooms or, you know, getting an apartment. They just stayed in hotels. And food was kind of expensive when you did that. We figured out, like I said, the place we were living in had been a mansion. And it had been divided into, into rooms. And... Uh, the kit, where, my kitchen had been the kitchen for this mansion, so you can imagine how big it was. Well, that's why they could put a sofa and chairs in there. And then our bedroom had been the butler's pantry. They had a double bed, they had a dresser, they had a little closet. What else you need? We're just there for a month or two, and it was and it was all furnished. And so what we did, uh, the kids would all get a pork chop a peach and I would get a big can of pork and beans. And then they would come to my house and I would fix the, the beans, you know, with, with the sugar and, and, and ketchup and onion and everything. And then we all laid our pork chop on that, it was a big oval thing, you know. And we'd all lay our pork chop on that and then we'd put that in the oven and bake it. So while that was baking, we'd play cards or whatever, you know, and wait until that was our supper. And we'd do that quite often because it was cheap and it was fun. So one night we were we were doing that and it was it was early. It was on a Saturday, so you know nobody had to go to work the next day. We decided we'd go to the movies. Now payday was Monday. And what we did was we all emptied our pockets and put it in the center of the uh, table, and we counted it out. We figured out if we could find a place to park on the street, we would have money for a popcorn and a, and a Coke. 
but if we had to go in the parking lot, we couldn't have that, we'd just have enough money for the tickets. So we, you know, okay, let's go. We went down to the movie house. Just as we pulled around the corner, the movie house was right there, just as we pulled around the corner, the last car parked, you know, before you got to the, to the uh, entrance to the theater, pulled out, we pulled in, we said, good, we get popcorn and pop. We thought it was fun. Well, the next day was Sunday, and I, you know, talking to Mom and Dad, and I was telling them about our going to the... My father broke down and cried. You mean you were... Why didn't you call me? I would have said you... I said, Daddy, payday is tomorrow. We're fine. I said, the rent's paid. We got food in the refrigerator. I said, this was just Saturday night we went, and we were able to get us a popcorn and a pop and the movie. Oh, but you don't get like that. You need money, you call me. And I said, okay, Papa, I will call you. My gosh, I did call him. A couple months later, I was very ill, and then we had moved down to, uh, to uh, Long Beach just before they went back out to sea. And we were down there, and I just was so terribly, deathly sick and found out I was pregnant. I remember the doctor down in Sandy, in uh, Long Beach after the exam. Because the, the doctor in, up there in San Francisco didn't know what, he said it was for pernicious anemia. He was giving me all kinds of shots and everything. And of course my papers went with me and the doctor that examined me down there, he got all the reason. He said, you know what, I'm going up there to San Francisco to a meeting next week and he said, I may be a hillbilly from West Virginia, but by gosh, I can tell you a pregnant woman when I see one. He said, wait till I get a hold of him. So there I am pregnant with a new car. My husband's, I'm going to you know, drive back, find somebody and drive back to uh, Portsmouth with it. And Harold got emergency leave to drive me home. But we had to have enough money in cash that if anything happened to the car, he could get on an airplane, get me to Portsmouth, and he could get back, And because they were going out to sea, going back to Korea. So we thought, well, we'll call my dad and ask him for $1,000, and we'll call his dad and ask him for $1,000. So that's what we did. Well, both of them said, yeah, they'd go down to Western Union and take care of it right away. So the kid comes, you know, the little delivery. This was another time. They had delivery boys on, on bicycles that went around delivering telegrams. Well, the kid knocks on the door, and I went to the door, and he said, uh, uh, you've got to come down to the office. We have a, a money uh, transfer for you, and be sure to bring your identification. So we got in the car, and we went down, and it was from my dad. It was $2,000. So we went back home, and we said, gee, now Pop's well, that's all right, we'll give it back to him, you know, when we get home, we'll spend what we have to him, we won't then. And, uh, same kid. Uh, you were just down there, weren't you? And I said, yeah. He said, well, you got another one then. He said, you're supposed to come down and pick up the money transfer. I said, okay, thanks. He said, boy, I wish I had somebody that was sending me money like that. But we went down and his dad had sent us money too, so we had all this money enough to get us home and, and safe and everything. And one, two of the officers were talking to each other, and one was talking about how he had a kid that his wife was cleaning him out down in Cincinnati, and he, his lawyer needed his presence before he lost everything he had. And the other guy said, well, I've got one going home tomorrow at Portsmouth. He, Aren't those near each other? Because one knew where, you know, down there around the Ohio River. And turned out, of course, yes, Portsmouth and Cincinnati. And so they uh, asked us, would we be willing to take him home with us? And instead of him flying, that way Harold could have relief uh, with the driving. And that's what we did. I mean, he lived in Hamilton, Ohio, I believe it was. And I know when we got to Cincinnati, he said, well, you can let me out here, I'll hitch there. Harold said, you help me drive across the country and I'm going to leave where it, it direct me. And we took him right to his door, of course. But on a ship, 
the two officers would meet each other and not from the same division. They were, di you know, in different divisions, and yet there it was, and I didn't have to drive anything. And when we got home, we got home about 3.30 in the afternoon, and my mother, of course, we pulled up in front of the store, you know, my mother come out, and she was crying. <gasps> the baby's dead before it ever got to live. Well, honey, in 1952, and you drive from, from Long Beach, California, to Portsmouth, Ohio, without stopping, you didn't do things. I mean, when you were pregnant, you were pregnant. You were delicate. And I'd been in a car all that time. And we didn't stop. I mean, we stopped to eat and, you know, everything. But no no rest. I mean, the boys took turns. One would sleep and the other one would drive. One would sleep and the other one would drive. But I was in the back seat just, I said, okay. But my mother, oh, I can still see her crying because... The baby was dead before it ever had a chance to live. But it wasn't dead. <laughs> oh, it's, it's been a great life. It's been a hard life at times. It's been a lot of trouble. But if you didn't ever have trouble, you'd never know how, how good you had it. And if you had it good all the time, I think that'd get boring. I might try it sometimes. But nevertheless. So, where do we go from there? Well, um, was it, where did you go to school, like high school then? Oh, I went, I went to St. Mary's from second grade to the first part of the uh, first month of the seventh grade, and I went up to Holy Redeemers, I graduated from Holy Redeemers. Was that, um, is it Notre Dame now? Yes, mm-hmm, yes. What, did the other kids think you were strange because you could speak two languages? I did have some problems, but uh, you know, I hear people say, oh, I'm discriminated against, and I'm so sad because, well, let's see, I was adopted at a time when that was, you didn't have cards announcing adoptions. It was like, oh dear, they're adopted, you know. No, really. So I was adopted. My parents were foreigners. They spoke with a definite accent. Uh, we were the only, well, there was a couple other Republican parties in our district, you know, in our precinct, but we were literally the only Republicans in a Democratic neighborhood. We were Catholics. Oh, my gosh, you know, Catholics eat babies, that type of thing. So we were Catholic. And you just, I always say, pick a which one do you want to pick? I had so many, dis if you want to call it, yes, there was discrimination for all of those reasons. But it was life. You just went on and, hey, I'll make it. And you make it. You, do. you make it. And you think, gosh, it's been great. It has. child, I've got stories I could go on until the cows came home and went back out again. You know, it's just, it's been so, when I was in the fourth grade, it was after Christmas vacation, and we were going, I was going to St. Mary's then, and there was four of us that met, and we would all walk down together. And it was the day after Christmas vacation. We had had high waters during the Christmas vacation. Not flooding, but high waters. And everybody was talking about how high the river had gotten. So there where uh, Bob and Floyd's is now, that was Barley Henderson. It was a gas station then. And uh, we climbed the levee because we wanted to see the high waters. We were early. and. Uh, so we climbed the levee and we wanted to see the high water. Well, we got to the top of the levee and we're looking and we don't see any water. We're all, you know, well, it's supposed to be high water, just, you know, oh my goodness, it's going to uh, come over the, the levee and we're going to have another flood. There's no water. So I said, well, it has to be down there someplace. And I was in the lead, running down the hill. 
Well, the water was there, but at the time, the bottoms was full of the most wonderful cornfields you'd ever want to see. And, of course, all those corn husks were still down. Well, as the water rose, the corn husks came up with the water. So, and the, it was a still day, no wind or anything. The corn husks were laying there on the top of the water, but they were solid, and you didn't see any water. So one minute I'm running, and the next minute I'm bobbing out to sea. And the other three kids went screaming back up the bank. Now, two things happened at that time. First off, I had gotten a swing dress, what was called a swing tail dress for Christmas. Remember, it was pink, had little polka dots on it. It was darling. And anyways, and it wasn't cold. There was snow on the ground, but it really wasn't cold. So my coat was not buttoned. When I stepped off into the water, my dress went out like this with, you know, with air under it. And I'm bobbing out to sea. Now, the girls went screaming up the bank, and this man showed up. He was a very tall man. He had on a, a, a long overcoat, and he was carrying a bamboo fishing pole. He ran down the bank, laid down on the ground, extended the fishing pole, and my fingertips went around that fishing pole. And he slowly brought me in, you know, and then I got a better grab on it. And he pulled me up on the, on the shore. Now there I was, I had been bobbing out to, as I said, I was on my way to the Ohio River. And we were on the side of the, you know, bobbing out. And uh, being kids in the fourth grade, we didn't talk. The man was gone. I don't ever remember him being there once he got, us up, got me up on the ground. We climbed the bank, ran down to, hold, to St. Mary's Church, or school, I went downstairs in the lavatory and the girls went up and said, Betty fell in the river. She's downstairs. And of course the sisters came down and they wrapped me up in the blankets and things. And I, I was telling Vasco Lukey about this the other day and he said, I did that. I don't remember doing that. And I told him yeah, where it was and he said, you know, I did have a car then. He was like a senior in high school and he had his own car. So the sisters had wrapped me up in blankets and then he carried me out to the car and took me home. And of course my mother figured I was going to die from that because I, I did get pneumonia, uh, you know, bronchitis real bad. I didn't do that for a long time. And she just, so she called the doctor and told him what had happened. And uh, I remember he told her to keep me hot all day, you know, turn the gas up high, keep me sweating all day long. And uh, he would be by, you know, after when his office hours were done. He said, I'll be by, but he said, right now I just want you to keep her hot, keep her sweating, and I'll be there. He said, there's not much we can do at this time. We'll see what happens. Honey, I had to go to school the next day. I was fine. Next day I woke up, you know, and well, there wasn't a thing wrong with me. And, Daddy did drive me down to school that day, but n n no kidding, I had to go to school the next day. And uh, anyways, Daddy, back in those days, from Chillicothe Street down 2nd, and then down uh, the Esplanade on Market, back up, down again, cross, and back up, nine-tenths of those buildings were saloons. And my father went down to that neighborhood. He parked his car there at Chillicothe and, and uh, Second Street, and he walked. All my father never walked. Honey, if he had to mail a letter, we lived in the middle of the block. If he had to mail a letter, he would get in the car, drive up to the corner, put the letter in the mailbox, go around, come back around, and back and park in front of the house. Walking was. What do you walk for? He walked. Every day, he would go down there to every one of the saloons that was down there. He would tell the bartender he was looking for the man that pulled the little girl out of the river on Monday. And after a few days of him going, and everybody kept saying, never heard of him, don't know anything about him. Finally, some of them started talking to him, and they said, sir, there couldn't have been anybody. It was 
cold, we had high water, snow on the ground, a man had a bamboo fishing pole, that's it? No, couldn't have been. And Daddy said, but four kids saw him, and he pulled my little girl out of the water, and I want to reward him. After a while, and every day when he'd come home, my mother would be sitting there in her rocking chair. He'd come in and she'd say, no, you find? He said, they keep telling me that, that there can't be anybody like that. But he said, these children saw, they all saw the same thing. The man with the long overcoat, every, the bamboo fishing pole. And mother would say, no, go ahead. You keep looking. I've already thanked him. She said, you think her angel's going to come down with white wings, uh, with the big wings and the white gown, and he, he's going to scare her to death. He came. How long was his fishing pole? Long enough that she could put her fingertips around it. He was there when she needed him. Yes. She said, okay, I've already thanked him. You go on. Keep, keep, keep trying. Keep trying. Well, of course, he never found him, because he's already back in heaven going, will that girl ever give me any rest? And you know, when I graduated from high school, my mother told me, because I, we lived there until I was a junior in high school. We moved over to 8th Street then, but at, uh, from that, from the time I came in second grade until junior in high school, we lived there behind the store. So every morning, as I'd walk down the steps into the grocery store and say goodbye, you know, as I was going out to, to go to school, my mother told me she stopped no matter who she was waiting on, what she was doing, she would stop for a minute and she'd say, Blessed Virgin, I have put her out the door. You please bring her back to me safe. And I said, you know, my angel has been very busy. Very busy. One time, they had told my family that I was going to make it that I'd be dead in a couple of days. And my daddy, I was 42 years old, and my father told me he had never in his life said, I love you. He had showed it in a million ways, but those actual words I never heard him say. So it's 8 o'clock in the morning, and here comes my father. The, uh, the, the sisters had already told the nurses, because then you couldn't come in until 11.30. 11.30 to 1 was visiting hours. My father would be there 7 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock at night. He'd pop it, come in, come in. And finally the, the nuns told the, the uh, different nurses, just leave him alone. He's not going to bother anybody. She's in a private room. If you need to have him out of the room, just tell him he needs to go in the hall for a little bit, and he'll do it. He, you know, he, di he didn't go in there screaming or howling, but he was just there. And so anyway, here he comes, about 8 o'clock in the morning. He came walking in, he sat down beside my bed, and he put a planter on the end table. And he took my hand, and you know, he asked me how I was. And, mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I talked to God all night. And he said, God told me, you're not going to die. He said, you show these doctors, you're not going to die. Because God said, he doesn't want you in heaven. He doesn't know what he would do with you up there. He no sends you to hell because you're not a bad girl. So God said, he leaves leave you a long time till he can decide what to do with you. And then he picked up the planter, and he showed it to me. I still have it, a ceramic planter, and the donkey is sitting here on his haunches, just like that, you know. What pop? And he said, you see this donkey? I said, yes. He said, you stubborn as that donkey. You show them you're not going to die, because God said you're not going to die. I'm 82. I was 42. I guess God hasn't decided what, what to do with me. Because Lord knows there's been times, there's been so many times that I, I, I told our doctor one time, I said, you know, someday you're going to come out of the hospital room and say, we've lost her. And Harold's going to look at you and say, will you go back in and make sure? I don't believe you. Because so many times I have 
come through for the next battle. It had cancer three times. Each time it was found in its earliest stages. So thank God for that. I mean, scared, but, you know, it turned out all right. But honestly, it is what Daddy had done. He'd got up that morning, and he'd went down to Kirby Flower Shop there at Galliard, Finley. He knew Mr. Kirby, known him all, you know, practically all his life anyway. He knew that he went in early to get things started before the store opened. He went down there and parked the car there by the side door, and when Mr. Kirby came and unlocked that back door, he went over and he said, to, I need something. And, you know, he asked him, what do you want? He said, I don't know. He said, I want something. I'm going to the hospital right now. He said, I need something. And he said, well, go look, see what you want, and, you know, I'll fix it for you. So he was walking, and he saw this ceramic plant, and he took it back, and, of course, he put greenery in it. And he brought it up, and that was, you see that donkey? You stubborn as that donkey. You show them. <laughs> but I have always said, you don't have to say, I love you, in those three words, but you can say it in a lot of us. He talked to God all night. I believe he did. <laughs> so we, we've had so many different, you know, so many different things. First I fall in the river, and then I get sick. One time we were at a picnic down to the stadium, and, uh, Gemma, she was the daughter of the gentleman that was like a brother to my father. So anyways, I got to go to the picnic because Gemma was going to be there. And they told her, you take care of her, don't let her get hurt. And oh God, they were constantly, don't let her get hurt. <laughs> so Gemma had gone out to her car to get something and as she was walking back into, because the picnic was there in the stadium, here, as she was walking back in, she happened to look up who do you think is walking the edge of the uh, stadium wall? Somebody had dared me to do it. I was up there. She said she sat there, or she stood there, and she said she just wanted to die right then. She said, I knew you were going to fall and get killed. And she said, I just as soon die right then as to go back home and tell them, I'm sorry, I turned my back for her. And she's walking the out. I walked the outside wall at the stadium. <laughs> oh, it was something. It was something. There is just, honey, I, I don't know where to stop. I mean, it, as I sit here, more and more things come to my mind. I know when we, uh, we're talking at I, I I got to work the polls last November and this week in my 82nd year well it was my 81st year last year because I wasn't quite 82 then I finally got to work the polls because when I was younger I always wanted to I mean my goodness I was into the political field by the time I was 10 I was in it and uh, anyways every time I was free to do it, there, you know, people are on the polls for years and years. There was no openings. So I never got to. Then when I finally, the kids were all raised and I had the time, my husband and I took turns of being seriously ill. We never were both sick at the same time. I mean, first it, him and his heart and me with my cancer, but we were never sick at the same time. There was always one of us to take care of the other one. And finally, last year, uh, the lady from the, from the election office called Carol and said, we need another Republican out there at Menford. She said, do you know of anybody that we could get? And I heard him on the speaker phone, you know, and I was sitting there, and she said, uh, Carol said, well, I don't know right offhand, but I'll think, you know, maybe some. And I'm going, me, 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 me. And I said, who is that? And Carol said, oh, that's my mother. She said, just a, she said, Mom, we would be gone for about 15 hours. Now, how do you think you're going to handle a day like that? I said, I can do it. I can do it. I've waited all my life to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. They, they said, let her 
could do it. I'm sure she could handle it. Well, we were gone. By the time, you know, they collect the, the ballots and they have to take them down to the courthouse and then we got back out to where we live and everything. We were gone 16 hours in November. We made it in a little over 15 hours this time. And I never had such a wonderful time. It was just to be there, something I wanted to do all my life and to be able to do it. It was, it was just an experience that I said, boy, if I live long enough, maybe I'll get all my bucket wishes out. <laughs> but it was fun. And, and I, another thing about my father, he got sick had to go to the hospital. It was the first time he'd ever been in the hospital in his life. And literally, the man was dying. And the doctor kept telling me, he said, I don't know why. He said, Betty, he's sick, but we've got it under control. He, if he'll just give us some help, he's going to make it. And I'd sit there and I said, Papa, you shouldn't, you've got to eat, you've got to do, you're, the doctor says you're going to be all right, just because it's the first time you've ever been in the hospital. You're lucky. But I said, honestly, no, right. I've had a long life, everything, you know. And he was d literally dying. And I just kept talking to him. And one day I said, Daddy, what is bothering you? What are you so worried about? I said, you've got good doctors, you've got a good hospital. Everybody is trying to help you, but you're not helping yourself. And he said, you know what next Tuesday is? And I said, no, it didn't come into my head right off. You know, I was worried about him. I said, no, I don't know. He said, next Tuesday, it's election day. I know get to go, I know get to go. And I, you know, the bells started ringing and everything. I said, Daddy, is that what's bothering you? And he said, well, you know, if I can go by, you know, I'm dying. I, what's the use of trying? And I said, Papa, all I got to do is go down to the courthouse and tell them that you're in the hospital, and two ladies will come up here next Tuesday morning. They will hand you your ballot. You will mark that ballot, put it in an envelope. They will turn their backs while you're doing it. It's your private. I will. I'll be here, but I will not be helping you. And you. Put your ballot in the envelope, hand it to the ladies, and they will put it in the in the ballot box down at the courthouse. He said, they do that in America? I said, well, of course they do that. It's your right to vote. It's not your fault that you're in the hospital. They'll come. And of course they did, you know. He started getting better from that day. I'm not joking. The man started to get better from that day. And he got to vote. And then I see people here. We had 23% turnout this year, or this, yeah, this year, 23%. On a beautiful day, you can't say, oh, it was rainy, oh, it was cold, oh, it was snowing. It was a beautiful day. And 23% of the people, don't they realize that they were picking out the next president of the United States? In the, in the end, if you think about it, because they were deciding who's going to be, who's going to get our delegates, who's going to run for one office, who's going to run for the other office, those two men will then meet each other for the most important job in the whole world, and they couldn't be bothered to come and mark their ballot. And my father almost died because he thought he couldn't vote that year. And it's not that long ago, it might have been 40 years ago, but it's not that long ago. Why do we do that? Why don't people have any more concern? I just don't understand. And like my father said, I don't care whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or whatever you are, go vote. It's your right to vote, go vote. And the majority will speak, whatever the majority is. And we'll live through whatever it is. We've had some pretty good presidents, we've had some pretty bad presidents, we've had some hard times. But we always end up coming back, just like mom and dad with the flood. They lost everything. They had nothing but mud and goop and gum, and they cleaned that up, and they went on. And that's what we all have to do. We've got to just clean it up and go on. 
what was yesterday you can't change it it's done and if you don't do something today you're not going to have a tomorrow to do it so there <laughs> I preached <laughs> well done, well done. <laughs> What? Oh, yes. You know, I got paid for going out there last year to the polls, you know. And I took my money and I bought my ticket for uh, the Benheim Steamroller and the Oak Ridge Boys. And I had a few dollars left and we bought tickets for. Oh, yes, and Darius Rock. I I, and this year, here I worked yesterday, or day before, you, whatever, two days ago, and uh, I've already spent it. Not all of it, but uh, we're going to, uh, this next week, we're going up here to Wheelersburg to see the shepherd. He's going to be, and I remember him from when I was younger, and he's got a lovely voice. I call him more a troubadour than just a... Uh, a singer. He's he's a storyteller, and he's got that mellow, beautiful voice, you know. And he's an older man now. And I, I just want to go. I don't want anybody else to go see him because I I want that theater to be full. But I got tickets for that, and we're going to see Barry Manilow again. He's going to be in Huntington next month, and we got tickets for that. So I said. She told me I have to get out and, and earn my money if I want to waste it on all these theater tickets. And I said, okay, I can do that. But no, you know, it just, it's fun to say, I earned that. It, it, it's, it's fun to do it. I remember seeing them when they were younger. In fact, I got a story about the Oak Ridge Boys. Bless their hearts. We were in Huntington when they had their first, uh, when they were on their first tour when they changed from gospel to secular music. And we were sitting in the first row of the second tier. And here's the last row of the first tier, the great big wide aisle. And I saw these women in the last row, they were all dressed alike, you know, in, in the long sleeves, high neckline, they had their hair in a bun. And you just didn't think of them as being at a, you know, a concert like that for, for the secular world. And the, the boys came in from a side door. Instead of coming all in the stage, they came in through this side door. And of course, all the music was swelling it. And these women turned, I can't turn very good to uh, cripple, but they turned so that, you know, they were like this, and their hands were up like this, and they were leaning out. Those boys recognized every one of those women. And what they said, because you could hear, I mean, they were right there, and we were, and the essence of what they said was, boys, you know we wouldn't be here if it weren't just to tell you that we love you and we want to support you in what you're going to do now. Don't ever do anything to make us ashamed of you because we love you and we do want you to do well. And every one of them, all four, shook hands with every one of those women as they came down, knew them by name and got the same story. And every one of them in their own words said, we'll never make you ashamed of us. Believe me, we will remember where we came from, and we will we'll never do anything to make you ashamed of us. And we're going now to see him. I think I think Joe was like 26 when we saw him that day, and I think he's about 56 now. And I think they've had a good, decent life, all four. The one has been kind of ill at times, but he's back and he's doing fine. But illness is not anything to be ashamed of. But I can still see these women, you know, they, we shouldn't really be here, but we wanted to support you. We wanted you to know you have our blessing, but we love you. And it was, I said, that was worth, without even seeing the concert, to have seen that expression of love. And that they knew these women by name. So you know they'd been to a lot of their concerts as, as they were getting together and getting it going. So anyways, I get to go see them every year. Whenever they come in close to town, you know, even if it's up in Huntington, I can get there. I've been to Charleston before to see a concert. So there's where my money goes. Just wasting it like crazy. And it's so much fun to have earned it, you know. 
That's another thing. That's a that's a lesson of life. If you earned it, it means a lot more to you. It really does. So I hope I haven't kept you too long. Oh, honey. <laughs> the next alcohol we might have to call you on back. <laughs> I'm well, sorry, do you want it once a week? <laughs> <laughs> you can cut out of that everything you want to. <laughs> I could tell oh, there's been so many so many things. And how times have changed. How back when I was nineteen, you know, I was working with my daddy. I graduated when I was seventeen. I was helping him manage the store and I was making good money and I was spending it. And after a while, one day we were sitting there and he said, how much money have you got in the bank? And we went, bank? Me? Uh-uh. So, <laughs> so that was that. Then I came in from a date one night and they were always there and either in the living room or the kitchen, no matter, well, I never came home late, so they were always up, you know, and I came in the kitchen, and I looked, and all around the outside of the kitchen floor were my shoes, and my father stood up, he went over, one, two, three, four, three, he counted each pair, okay, 32 pairs. So he says to me, nobody with two feet needs 32 pairs of shoes. I go, oh, I do too, Daddy. I need these for this purple dress, and I need these for this, uh, and I need, oh, and, and I have to have these for, he said, no, you don't need that many. Now he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, you show me $1,000 in the bank, and I will buy you any new car you want. Pay the rest of it, but you got to pay a thousand dollars on it. I said, when do we start? He said, now. He said, I pay you, you do what you want, and he said, when you can show me a thousand dollars, he said, we'll go, we'll get the, anyone you want, whichever you pick out. I said, okay. Well, honey, I got paid on Saturday night, and Sunday night, I went to, Saturday was date night, which I didn't date. I was, I didn't date that early. And uh, so I got paid on Saturday night. Sunday night I took 55 cents out of my pay. And it was 50 cents for a ticket to the Leroy. And you could go to the Cameo for a nickel to get a, a glass of Coke, spend as long as you want. Well, we all went, Saturday night was date night, so the kids that had dates went to the date night. Then Sunday night, we all went to the movies together. There'd be gangs of us. And then we always would hurry to get over to the cameo before the kids from PHS got it, and then they'd go over to the Modern Grill, or vice versa, you know. We, we, and so anyways, I, I was doing that, and it was sometime in the spring, mother wanted to go shopping. So I took her down to the store, and she picked out two dresses. I have to tell you, they were the ugliest things I've ever seen in my life. And I said, Mom, Dad's not going to like those. I said, honey, they just aren't right. Oh, I like. I like them. So we took them home. Well, of course, the minute Dad, she didn't have to try them on. She just showed them to me. He said, those are terrible. You don't look good in that. And she said, well, maybe you're right. So she said, all right. She said, uh, Betty can take them back tomorrow. They got them at Kobacker's. And she said, Betty can take them back tomorrow. And I said, well, uh, well you, I don't know what to get you. And she said, oh, I don't want them. And, uh, I said, okay, I'll get your money back. She said, I don't bother with that. She said, you go ahead and pick out a couple dresses. You take those back and just pick you out. Of now, I had a closet full of dresses, but I hadn't bought a new dress in three months. I hadn't bought a pair of shoes. I hadn't bought anything but a Coca-Cola <laughs> and a theater ticket. My mother did that so that I would go get a couple new, just, they weren't very expensive, but just the idea that 
she wasn't giving me the money. Oh, well, you you just get, get a, a couple dresses for yourself. Right. I'd go down some other time. Of life. <laughs> yeah. That's a mother. But I did. I uh, When January, then January was the fine time because that's when cars came out. They, they're already bringing out the 2013s, and we haven't even got into May yet. Practically, you know, they're ready. So anyway, back in those days, in January, every one of the dealerships had a Sunday when they introduced their cars. And it was, people went in droves to see the new car of the season. So I decided, I mean, the children always say, well, you were a spoiled brat. And I go, I was not. My father said I could have any car I wanted. And I thought about it. And at the time, <clears throat> I don't know if I should say this, but at the time, Ford was fix or repair daily. Didn't want a Ford. The uh, Chevrolet was a good car. The Pontiac was a better car. But the Chevrolet was a nice, you know, moderately priced, decent car. So I said, I want a Chevrolet. So we went down, down here at Second and, and Chillicothe Street, the Lochner Chevrolet dealership. We went in. Of course, the salesman all knew my father. And, oh, hi, how are you doing today, Mr. Chapin? Oh, let us show you this, what we got on this new, oh, it's, you know, a dealer, a, a, a salesman. And Daddy said, he said, I'm not buying it. Betty's buying it. Talk to her. Oh, okay, honey. And next thing, they're showing him some other, Mr. Sebastian, look at this. Well, about the third time that he said, I'm not buying it, Betty's buying it, I'd had all I could take. I turned around and just walked out. Went outside, got in the car, and sat down. I shut the door. Daddy looked out and saw me sitting there. He told the guys, he said, you just lost a sale. She's not coming back in here. I know her. And he came out, and he got in the car, and he said, where do you want to go now? And I said, well, I said, I want to go up to Pontiac, because my best friend's brother worked up there. I said, I want to go up to Pontiac if you don't care. He said, I told you, get what you want. And I went up to Pontiac, and I picked out exactly what I wanted. I wanted to deliver it on April the 1st, because I had it all, you know, that's when the $1,000 would be available. And uh, so that's why we went in January, because then you could pick out what color you wanted, what uh, upholstery, you could pick out everything. But you wanted to give them a little time, and then you'd get part. So I told them exactly what I wanted, and April the 1st. And they said, well, how do you want to pay for it? And I said, well, we'll pay cash for it. I said, I'll have my thousand and whatever the rest of it is, daddy will take care of it. So a couple days later, we were out to the store, and here comes two guys from Glockner's. They had the car I, I had been looking at, and then a car for them to go back. And they came in and well, now we thought we'd bring this car out and you could try it out this evening and, and bring it down to us tomorrow whenever you want to because I know you're going to like it. And I said, sorry, I already bought a car. And then, of course, they wouldn't know which one and all that. And I told them. And the fatal mistake, one of them said, how much did you pay down on it? I said, I didn't pay anything down on it. I'm going to pay cash for it. And they said, when the car comes, you know, the deal would be done. And the guy said, you didn't give them anything? And I said, no, just my word that I'll take it on April the 1st. And they said, well, you don't have to honor that. Just call them and tell them you don't want it anymore because ours is cheaper and ours is better and blah, blah, blah. And Daddy was just standing back there, just kind of looking. What's his little girl going to do? And I looked at them and I said, get your car and go back down there and I don't ever want to see you guys again. I said, number one, I got mad at you yesterday because you wouldn't talk, or the day before yesterday because you wouldn't talk to me. And I said, now you're telling me to dishonor my word. My father taught me that my word is worth more than anything in this world. I said, I don't want to see you. I said, just take your car and go and don't bother me. And I did not buy a car off of them until, good God, Andy was already graduated from college, I think. Or, you know, he went to that college for dealers and everything. I don't think I bought one because Andy and my son graduated together. So, you know, we, they had been friends. And so I went out at that time and started buying cars off of them. But that's how long it took for me to get. 
I just, it was bad enough that they brought, okay, you're bringing the car, you want to show it to me, you're trying to make up, fine. But when he said, oh, you don't have to take it if, if you didn't pay anything on it, I said, but my word said, my father had raised me, that my word was my bond. So, that's what I did. But I got my beautiful new car. Oh gosh, it was a beauty. It was a beauty. It was such, and then I, when I got, when they brought it, uh, I didn't have any money for, well, the insurance. I had no money for the insurance. I didn't even have money to put gasoline in it. <laughs> and I remember my father called Mr. Dillon and said, come out here, eat. We got a car for, or Betty got a car, and it's in her name, but he said, come out and write her a policy. So he took care of that. My mother handed me $25 to go get gas. Well, gasoline, you could fill it up for $5 in those days. You could fill it up for $5, but I didn't have a penny. I didn't have a penny, but I had the $1,000. But I learned it, and you know what? I got along just fine with that 32 pairs of shoes. Didn't need a pair of shoes for a long time. But it was just, you know, when you're a kid, you, and the, the kids do it today. They do it today. Get their first paycheck, and first off, they cry because all the money that got taken out for taxes, they go, why well, did, I said, hey, welcome to the new world. <laughs> But yes, I understand that, because I did the same. We all did, if we want to be honest. We all did. But I have enjoyed this. It's been fun. I just wish we had time to go do some more, but I know you have other things to do, but oh gosh, it's... You know, I used to live right there in that house, right next door to you. Oh yeah. That was ours. Oh, it's a little gate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right next door. The one down there on Waller Street. The only house left on Waller on uh, 8508 there, 508 is, that was our house. And Fred used to come out, our oldest one, he would come out the back door there and come in and get his books. And I was kind of ill. I've been ill several times in my life, really bad off, you know, and the ladies knew it. And uh, they fixed it couldn't do it today, I know you couldn't, but in those days, he would come, he'd get his own books, then he'd go upstairs, and he would get several books, from me, and he always told them, my mother wants, never, you know, because he, kids weren't allowed up there, but they always knew when he came that it was okay, and he'd, and he'd always say, my mother wants these, and they would put those on my card, and then give him his own, and the way I punished him when he was little, you put him in his room or do anything like that didn't work I'd say you can't go to the library or oh, if I was really mad you can't go to the library for seven days Whew. that was punishment and I'm not joking that was punishment it really was and they finally let him come up and because he read everything he wanted out of the children's and then he came up and he picked out books that he wanted and he'd always say, my mother wants these. And they go, okay. And they knew he was reading them, but he, you know, but that was his punishment was, can't go to the library for seven days. Man, you broke the rules. <laughs> oh, well. Well, listen, I will say, I will say that I have to stop. I know I do. <laughs> Yeah, I should probably be clocking out pretty soon. <laughs> But um, <laughs> we're going to do more of these kind of all calls, like how we did this time. But don't let, just because you've been in here before, don't let that stop you, okay? So I can tell you some more. Again. <laughs> like, Honey, I can tell you, like the time they said I was going to die. I'll, this is not for today, but mm -hmm. another time. They said I was going to die, and I, I had about three months to live. And we had planned a trip for ten years. And the trip was coming up, and I cried. And then I said to Harold, you know, we can do one of two things. We can go home, and I can cry for the next three months, and my children will always remember their mother crying all the time. I said, or we can take the trip, 
hope that God will see us through and it'll be okay. Our doctor actually fixed, had his secretary fix up a list for us. Every state that we were going to go through, because we were on, we went 7,000 miles. I mean, we drifted, honey. We'd planned it for 10 years, and we, knew, and we had six weeks to do it in. And we, he, my husband left here with the knowledge on his head that he might not bring me home alive, and with a list of what he had to, who he had to notify in whichever state I would pass away. They had telephone numbers and everything. They had it all. And I'm still here. As my papa says, God doesn't know what to do with you yet. But, you know, I've, and then all oh, some of the adventures we had on that trip. It was, it was fantastic. It was. We took five kids in a spare. We had five of our own and took an extra one. It was a blast. It was there were places that I couldn't. Uh, well, someday we'll have to go back to the to the Yellowstone. Maybe I can. Well, with the motorized wheelchairs, I can do it today. Yeah, the, we checked in with the uh, with the Rangers when we got to Yellowstone, and they told Harold, in the event that something serious happened here, he was to tie a handkerchief on the uh, uh, door handle. And if they see a handkerchief fluttering on a door handle, they will, with their, you know, with their sirens, they will get you and escort you on. They said, come quickly, but, you know, don't. And, of course, we had all the kids, and they said, uh, I said, we're traveling with another couple. So, you know, we were always next to each other. They said, well, I'm sure they're, they're in charge of the kids, and put that hand handkerchief on the door handle and head for the hospital. We'll pick you up. And I couldn't go. Oh, God. But you know what I did? I would sit on a bench. The children would take turns. From the oldest to the youngest, they would take turns. It's my turn to sit with mom. They would sit with me and I would teach them how to watch crowds, how to let their imaginations roam. Where do you think this, these people came from? Where do you think, what do you think of how they're acting? How were you? And we would observe. And the children, instead of saying, I want to go with Daddy, they go, it's my turn. And they'd sit with me, and then Dad would take the other five and go, you know, and see things that, that were beyond my, but I had a good time. I had a real good time. You know, one, one evening we were getting ready to, we were going to sp spend the night before, just before we got to Yellowstone, and uh, it was a free park. Well, we went down into, but it was full of mosquitoes and gnats, and I mean, and there was nobody there. So we were coming back out, and this couple was coming in with a little baby, and we stopped, you know, and we told them, we said, you really don't want to stay down there tonight. I said, it's, it's full of gnats and mosquitoes, and you can't even breathe hardly. And they said, well, we're on our way home, and we're really short on money, and this will going to help, you know, that we don't have to pay here tonight. And they said, we'll watch. So I said, okay, kids, find the bug bombs, because everybody had their own bug bomb, you know. And we stopped, and, you know, we were sitting there, and, and the kids all got out of the car. Some of them had them in the car, some had them in the trailer, you know, and they found all of them, because who knew how much was in any of them. And we gave them all to them. Said, if you're going to be down there, at least have this, and it'll help you. So thank you and goodbye. Next day, late afternoon, you know, I'm sitting on a bench with one of the kids, and we're sitting there looking at what's going on and everything. Here comes the young boy and the young girl, and they recognized me, and they, and they told me, you know, how the the bombs helped them so much the night, and they didn't know what they would have done without them, and thank you. So, and I said, isn't that wonderful that in a, in a park that big, that we would get to see each other again. We got to see each other again. It just things like that. Oh, I got to let you go. I know you got to go home. And I'm ready to go. I guess.